You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Buongiorno. I'm Lisa Birnbach, and I am being a jerk because I just came back from eight days in Italy. My hashtag was don't hate me. I was just so defensive if I posted a picture from the trip because I know how lucky I am, and I know that people say I'm jealous of a trip. I'd be jealous of a trip. I'm jealous of your trips. Don't kid yourself. I'm a jealous girl. But I feel very lucky. I feel very refreshed. And it's true what they say. Travel is broadening. And I'm not referring to the three pounds I gained from all that spaghetti cacio e pepe. But learning how to successfully manage in a country where English isn't universally spoken makes you sort of right-sized. You don't feel like a big shot. You cannot feel that you're understood. You have to feel that you need to explain yourself. People may not think the way we think, and they may not like the ways that we do things. And you have to be much more mindful. I know that word has become kind of a cliche, but it's true. We were in a small town in Umbria, English was rarely heard. My instinct was to try to speak Italian based on the little scraps of the language I know. But, you know, you can't ask for spaghetti cacio a pepe when you're at the pharmacy, and you can't say a la pesto when you uh, are looking for the train schedule. It was primitive, my attempts to be Italian, but it mostly worked. Being an American abroad makes one think a lot about what it means to be an American, what it means to oneself, what it means to others. As the world gets smaller, of course, we are all citizens of the world. But there are little things like thinking about kilometers instead of miles and euros instead of dollars and bigger things about attitudes, values. I do like the Italian custom of closing work down for a proper lunch hour. I do like that. As a city dweller, being in the countryside was a treat. Yes, we actually woke to the sound of roosters, woodpeckers, and morning doves. It gave our mornings a dreamy quality. You really feel you're away away. And in any case, I want to thank my friend Marsha for inviting us to her place and being such a generous and wonderful host. Here are my five things. I can't even say that phrase in Italian. How sad is that? Here are my five pastas. Number one, a fresco. Not just any fresco. My friend Diane alerted me to the existence of a famous Piero della Francesca fresco, say that five times fast, of the pregnant Madonna in a small town in Umbria called Monterchi. The town is walled, as many of those old, old towns and villages are, and it's tiny with a population somewhere between 1,200 and 2,000 inhabitants. And yet, this tiny little town has two museums. One is completely and only dedicated to that fresco, because pregnant Madonnas are rare. So there's one museum for that and one museum dedicated to scales. Weights, old-fashioned and ancient scales, scales to weigh animals, scales to weigh hay, scales to weigh bambinos, bambini. I have to confess, one room of scales would have been really pretty adequate. Seven rooms of scales was, was enough for a lifetime. But nevertheless, one ticket gets you admission to both museums in Monterkey. The young woman who sold us our tickets said she liked living in a small town where she knew everyone and everyone knew her. Her English was very good. Later that night, our friends and us went to dinner. Our friends and I. Our friends and us. Gee, that's disturbing, isn't it? I guess my Italian has taken over my grammar. Um, All of us had dinner in a little town called Anghiari, which is, I don't know, 45 minutes from Monterkey. And guess who I see walking around town? My friend, the ticket taker. I don't know who recognized whom first, but we gave each other a warm hello. And that was one of the highlights of my trip, was feeling, hmm, I guess this is possible. You could live here and make some friends and feel settled here. 
in a beautiful, beautiful world. Number two, one thing about Tuscany and Umbria, there's an abundance of jasmine. Oh, my God. If you haven't gotten a whiff of jasmine lately, just go find some and smell it and smell it right now. It's heavenly. It was everywhere. And I found that I did that thing I do when I smell lilacs. I sighed. Oh, my God. What have I turned into? Number three, don't answer that. The lovely man who is an expert and charming tailor we met in Rome. His name is Michele Am Russo. I hope I pronounced that right. We just dropped into a shop which was so beautiful. It looked kind of monastic, like very simple cement walls and very sort of dark. And it, it could have looked like a chapel almost, minus the stained glass. But it had room after room of incredible fabrics. He makes clothes. The store is called Bomba, by the way, B-O-M-B-A, on Via del Loca in Rome, which had one beautiful shop after another. But he was such a charming man, and he saw that I was touching everything on his shelves, the velvets and the silks and the corduroy. He had wide, wide whale corduroy and mohairs and, oh, just incredible things. And then he said, can I show you my workroom? I'm a bespoke. Uh, I, I do bespoke uh, work. I didn't even, his English is perfect. I don't know why I'm sounding like such a jerk. Anyway, he was wonderful. He took such pleasure in this stack of fabrics that he had loomed in India after the artwork of a painter friend of his family. And this style, which was Japanese and vintage, and um, he didn't mind my touching everything, and he took us up to his workroom, and it was almost a separate adventure. It was incredible. I'm going to post pictures of his walls of color, of fabric, and I think even of Michele himself on my website at lisabernbach.com, which is still in English. It is not in Italian yet. Number four, European pharmacies. They are the best. First of all, the products all look exotic and appealing in their foreign packaging. Oh, this beautiful tube of face cream is really for your feet? Ah, oh, whatever. The tube looks so good. And if it's product lines that you buy here at home, they're much less expensive there. And if you need a prescription filled, there's a chance that the medication is considered over-the-counter in Europe. Note to the American girls I met in Assisi, not you and your Adderall. No, that is not okay. They were on to you, and so was I. Number five. The novel Normal People by Sally Rooney, which I read last week. I had discovered this young writer. And when I say young, she was born in 1991, after Exhibit A was born. Oh, wait, she's younger than Exhibit A? I could be her madre. Wow, Sally is incredible. She was Irish. I discovered her through a short story she had published in The New Yorker. But this novel, Normal People, just broke my heart many times over the course of it. It's told in a way that is both emotionally urgent and emotionally detached. It's a love story with a protagonist who, while growing up, sees herself kind of damaged, well, very damaged and unlovable. It spans three years. It's kind of coming of age, but that diminishes what it is. It's beautiful. That's all I'll say. And the author seems to understand her characters in a breathtaking way. So I recommend it to you. And now I am very pleased to welcome my two guests today who are not a couple, who don't work together, but who are both engaged in the world of nonprofit giving back. They are Jessica Mindich and Amy Peterson. Welcome, my two guests today. They have brought sunshine into this gloomy day that we are having in New York. Jessica Mindich, I have known since 2010. We had a brief correspondence when I was working on my book, True Prep, and one day I was in a gourmet store, and she heard my voice and said, are you Lisa Birnbach? Weird 
she's she's spooky and knows a million and one things I, I, I Jessica is just an amazing young woman who now runs the Caliber Foundation and runs I want to say this correctly Caliber Caliber Collection Collection right. which is and I've written about Jessica for Town and Country Magazine she actually is the largest private gun, illegal gun buyback person in America. And I said that completely wrong, but also completely correctly. And she buys back guns that should not be out on the street and has them shredded according to the police protocols and the bullet casings shredded and makes them into jewelry that is a constant reminder of gun violence in this country, which she is dedicated to helping to end. Her protege, not really, is Amy Peterson, who is here from Detroit. Young Amy Peterson, formerly the legal counsel for the Detroit Tigers, formerly a nonprofit executive in Detroit, where she's not from, but has lived, is now the CEO founder of Rebel Nell, which is a very cool company in Detroit, which makes jewelry out of, real jewelry out of graffiti that she will explain how she scrapes it off buildings in Detroit and thus empowering the, all the profits go to homeless women in Detroit and helps get them on their feet and the profits go to also the women who make the jewelry now have gainful employment. They are both lawyers. They're both mothers. They're both chic. <laughs> they're both funny. And I'm just really impressed by the two of you. So welcome. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. So you met each other in Detroit, how many years ago, couple? We really only met in person maybe a year ago, but we uh, had been connected through other friends, and as it turns out, we, there are many people that overlap, as that usually tends to happen when people are united in the same way of living and, and giving back. Um, but it was instant, and it, there were so many different synergies, and Amy is... Uh, what she has achieved and created is very, very impressive, and I'm really proud to be a part of some part of your journey. So I'm really excited to have you here in New York, and let's hear more about it. <laughs> One thing that I, I, I want to talk about first is what I know about you, Jess, because the thing is, you started out making jewelry as a, fun, as a, mean, a means of fundraising. Here, here, Choate School... I'll make a, a rendition, a beautiful rendition of your school seal, and I'll wholesale it to you for almost nothing, and you can sell it as a pendant or a bracelet and raise money for your school. And lots of schools did it. We did it with True Prep. We, You made a beautiful seal for us. And that was a very cool way to give back after your career as a lawyer and your kids started to be in school and after school programs for a long time. But then you met Cory Booker and he thought that you could merge your missions. He was mayor of Newark then. Newark had a terrible gun problem. Look, there's a terrible gun problem everywhere. Um, and you became such a passionate fighter for what you believe. But there's a picture I've seen of you standing on, is it seven mile or eight mile or nine mile in Detroit? Yeah, seven mile. Where, seven M&M, mile. yeah. yeah. Eight, yeah. Eight, seven miles worse than eight mile, if you've, if you've, had, if you've really been following Eminem's rap, which I know sure that you have. <laughs> which I have, yeah, right. which, you know, it, it's very inspiring to me. And there you are in, I, I think, a pair of Manila <laughs> Blahniks and... <laughs> wow, cut right to it. Yeah, no, but I mean... It's forget that you're so chic. It's that 
you know, you're this nice white lady who wanted to, who asked the police chiefs, should we serve food and <laughs> the sandwiches? <laughs> I mean, you ha- entered a world that was so, so opposite your own world and without fear. I mean, I'm really proud of you. And I don't even Thank get you. to be proud of you. Thank you. Because I didn't make you, but uh, I am <laughs> proud of you. Thank you. I um, you know, were when, you ever scared? Um, no, and it was when I was doing a photo shoot in Newark, uh, in front of the police department, and I realized that there were three undercover bodyguards for the uh, the police chief, and there were also armed police protecting us just so we could stand in front of the police department that I thought, I should probably pay better attention to what's really happening here. Um, no, I'm, I wasn't afraid because I always felt that my the reason I was coming into communities that I didn't live in and, um, and were so dangerous was so pure and authentic that it never even dawned on me that I was uh, a voyeur or um, somehow not blending, even though I, my I never wanted to pretend that I could really experience what everybody in these communities was feeling. I mean, Detroit uh, has the unbelievable recognition many years in a row of being the first or second most dangerous city in America. Um, And so I didn't want to be uh, standing there and saying, oh, I know, right? I, I, I get this. I wanted to be standing there and saying, I'm truly here because I'm care and I want to listen, but uh, I'm not going to pretend I'm, I walk a day in this, in your shoes or in, and so therefore I put on Manolo's. (laughs) (laughs) Amy, you moved to Detroit 19 years ago? Actually, it was 13 years ago. 13 years ago. Roughly, yes. Were you scared to live in Detroit, in downtown Detroit at that point? I... I I wasn't maybe I I should have been I there was nobody living in Detroit in 2007 um and you know kind of like like Jessica like this this was Detroit gave me an opportunity to pursue my dream of you know wanting to work in sports and I had been rejected by every other city and so I I had a different glasses when I rolled into Detroit. And so this was a city of opportunity for me. Um, and I, you know, very naively didn't didn't know about the history, didn't know kind of what the city had gone through until I, you know, moved there and started going to local bars and chatting with people and finding out what, you know, learning more and, and being sensitive to what the city had gone through. And, uh, but yeah, I had a, I had a different, a different eyesight for Detroit than than many people who've lived there many years. Well, so you went out to work for the Detroit Tigers. You were a baseball fanatic, Mm -hmm. and they gave you a shot working as their lawyer. Actually, I started as an intern and then just kind of worked my way up. You were an intern with a law degree. I was an intern with a law degree and a business degree and just was willing to work for free in any opportunity that came along. Wait a second. They really didn't pay you at first? Uh, It was... uh, I I think the first couple months I I was not paid and then the the laws changed and and we had to be paid. <laughs> wow, <laughs> wow! And at any point did people, even once you were there, try to talk you out not of working there but of living in downtown of the city that was that was once such a majestic city. You know, a lot of people that I worked with thought I was absolutely out of my mind. Um, I thought it was great. I could walk to work. You know, no place. In no other city could I fulfill this dream where I could not only work for the team, but then live and afford to live close enough to the ballpark, ball, you know, stadium that I could walk. And so I was like, this place is amazing. Um, But yeah, I mean, everybody that I worked with thought I was, I'd lost my marbles. Uh, Did you ever feel unsafe? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. There were people that tried. I was, I was, there's so many stories. (laughs) But um, you're a you're a wee thing. You're a wee blonde yeah, I was, thing. I was going to say you really need a visual on, on yeah. this person talking right now. It's like yeah. the cutest blonde, adorable, oh, adorable, thing Thank you. walking the streets of the city, just with rose colored glasses on. It's it's actually a, the perfect thing to remember. It's that it's all how you see it. Yes, yes, absolutely. You were thinking this is fantastic. Yes, and every. And and so you were impervious, maybe, in some respect, to dangers around. 
And maybe that's the the uh, one of the ties that binds is that if you if you're going to spend time obsessing over the dangers, you can't move forward and right. and achieve break down certain walls, achieve certain things, or really uh, in your heart give back. If you're just really focused so inward on how it, this the surroundings affect you, yeah, right. I think you're right. Yeah. And speaking of walls, which was thank thank you for doing that. <laughs> um, I am very curious, and I'm admiring the jewelry you're wearing, how you physically scrape paint off walls in Detroit or anywhere, and they don't crumble into powder. How does that work? Yeah, and actually, we have a really strict policy where we won't touch it till it falls on the ground. So Ah. in Detroit, and I mean, similar to New York, we have harsh winters, and we know exactly where to look in Detroit for this fallen street art, fallen graffiti. So we go on harvests, essentially, with Tupperware, and we just pick it up once it falls on the ground and take it back to our studio and take it through a special process to reveal the layers that make up that particular slab of graffiti. And then from there, it's we turn that into... So it stays stuff. intact. Mm-hmm. It, doesn't, it doesn't degrade or turn into... No, we have pretty solid How, chunks. Yeah. 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 And then you polish them. That's correct. So they look like uh, semi-precious stones when you set them. I guess that's the kind of the idea, right? Yeah. They have and, the same appeal. And no no two are ever alike. And we, we love that message that everybody's one of no other kind. And it works for us. And the the process of shredding guns is quite complicated. Um Tell us about it a little, if you well, can. Um, guns are, they don't degrade. So being able to destroy them is not only important because that means they're never going back on the street again, but also as a private citizen, I can't take them into my possession until they're rendered inoperable. It was really important to us, just like you take um, the authentic art that has fallen to the ground and you can make something out of sort of destruction. It was really important for us to take a crime scene, guns, when a gun is fired, shell casings fall to the ground and transform that crime scene into jewelry that would be a symbol of hope and would also provide a way to raise money for future gun buybacks. So there's a lot of symbolism in like the from the ground to whether it's necks of people who, don't, who will never walk the streets of these cities or people who are very proudly walking the streets and want some way to engage um, in causes that um, and communities that they don't necessarily have an, an entree into. And then you discover that you are helping people in so many, many ways. It's just, as you said, you don't think about your own fear anymore. Yeah. You think about how this particular casing will remind the survivor of a of a looting or will will be comforting to somebody who who has some identification with it. Yeah, we always say uh, wear proudly because p- people, you know, there's a lot of jewelry out there, there's a lot of accessories and you when you ch- what you choose which goes back to true prep and the official prep handbook is that people want to wear a symbol of what they're proud of, mm-hmm. symbol of who they are. Mm-hmm. And I think that just like representing uh, a city's history, art, um, destruction uh, pain and that there can be uh, hope after pain. It really means a lot to us that when people are able to find power when they wear these bracelets. I, you know, I sometimes put on too many that I feel like I look like Wonder Woman, but it's just truly there's something about the metal that retains, um, even though so much heat has been used to transform it, that retains that energy. Yeah, absolutely. So. Absolutely. And how do people react to graffiti? jewelry, the Rebel Nail jewelry, and how are people finding out about it? Well, we have an amazing um, community in Detroit, and that's where it really started. And, you know, being such a small startup, we didn't have a big marketing budget, so word of mouth was very incredible and and a powerful tool for us to, to get off the ground. But the story behind each piece is really resonates. It's that not only the preservation of, of artwork in the city, but each piece is not only one of a kind because of the cross-section of graffiti, but because of the woman who made it and the mission behind it and how it's really transformative for the the woman whose time and energy and creativity went into making the piece translates to the consumer. And I love that. My favorite part is being there when somebody buys something that one of our team had a vision for and 
that that connection that happens. And sometimes I, our ladies are there to witness it. Sometimes they're not because it's off site. But I know and I can go back and tell them. And uh, that to me is powerful. And I think one of the greatest compliments we've received and we've received a couple of them is, um, you know, thank you for doing what you do. I knew I was going to have a tough day today. So I I proudly wore my rebel now. And I was like, that's what I want. That, that's the nugget right there is that, you know, not only are we empowering with our jewelry, but that those who wear it feel empowered as well. That's fantastic. When, uh, how old is the company? Six years old. Six years old. And in the six years and in the 13 years, could you walk us through a little bit how Detroit has changed? Because I haven't been to Detroit in a bit, but I feel like between Shinola and the guy who's the website guy who's buying up a lot of real Dan estate. Dan Gilbert. Yeah, Quicken Dan Gilbert, loans, yeah. Quicken Loans. And the the art world that's saying, uh, write, write a house, or oh, isn't there yeah. an essay? Sarah Cox, yes. A yes. friend of mine, actually. Of course. That there is some um, restoration, some kind of rebuilding, and some kind of raw, raw spirit in a city that deserves to to survive or to come back and you know all we think of is bombed out buildings mm-hmm. and areas of a city that no longer get utility support because because the population was so sparse yeah and it's it, you would i mean from 2007 to now you would barely recognize the city it's just two completely different looking um uh, sites and you know, when I first moved downtown, I think um, it was 60% of the skyline was abandoned. So, you know, what you see out my out your window, 60% of that uh, mm. was nobody was in. And now it's it's pretty close to full occupancy and continues to evolve and continues to change. Um, and it's, it's a, I would never want to be in the position uh, of those who have to make a lot of the decisions about what's happening and who's coming into town because, you know, you want to make sure that the Detroit that we're seeing now is as inclusive as possible. Um, and sometimes I worry a little bit about that uh, just from feedback that we hear from our ladies that are like, oh, no, I wouldn't I wouldn't go downtown. That town, Downtown's not for me. And that 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 makes me sad that that's we got to find a way to make it very comfortable for everybody, right. but what's the balance? And I, I don't know the answer to that, but there has certainly been an, a tremendous renaissance happened in Detroit. Uh, it's now becoming a food hub, and uh, there's... We one back, hotel after another. One hotel up. after another. And back in the day, like, a one restaurant would open, and yeah. it would be front page news because we didn't have any. We literally had... When I moved there, there were, like, three places you could recommend. I remember somebody telling me that the biggest problem Quicken Loans faces is having enough... Uh, affordable housing for all the employees that uh, want to come and work there, and uh-huh. that that's the building of micro apartments, and they, because everybody wants to be down in the the growth of industry mm-hmm. is so major. But to to be clear, you're talking about a certain mile radius. The seven point two is what they uh, call. Yeah, yeah. A- outside of that area, it faces still faces incredible challenges, like you're talking about oh, potable water, uh, yep. school well, Flint, zones. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but right. really, you know, not not even as far as Flint, just really like, a, you know, a mile or so outside of like the core of... And you have to think of it, what's, what's fascinating about Detroit is that it, it's so massive from a land perspective. I think uh, the, the statistic is that you can fit um, New York, Boston, and San Francisco into Detroit, but we only have 700 thousand people so it's so spread out and there's there's just there's no not real connections yet they're starting to pop up and then the mayor who i applaud i think he's doing a great job is starting to put some more emphasis on the neighborhoods which is certainly what what needs to happen but Mm -hmm. we've even seen since what we do is we hire women directly out of the shelter and we try and find them housing six years ago finding them housing in detroit was not a problem now it's getting harder and harder, and we're trying. We're now starting to see them, because just of the affordability component, that they're moving a little closer to the edge of the city. The city still needs to work on support services yeah. for its population, and the suburbs need to evolve somehow, right? Yeah. Well, they need they need more people like Rebel Nell and Amy because they need you need to have jobs that provide sustainable wages and yeah. provide mentorship for future generations. It's the key to uh, growth 
permanent growth for a city, not outsourcing everything and um, bringing those people together. So Amy's Amy's business model follows that. She one of the other things that she you do at Rebel Now is you provide financial literacy mm-hmm. literacy education for oh, these women. Oh, how wonderful! So it's it's a real it's exactly it's a future uh, reaching um, set of skill sets. In, in addition to sustainable wages, in addition to mentorship, uh, which That's is so very exciting. Smart. That's so yeah. smart. So yeah. you're giving them a fishing pole instead of a fish. Yes. We absolutely believe that we are teaching women to fish. And we, I think we do a, a pretty great job of, of tackling a lot of barriers that have been prohibitive in the past. Uh-huh. Making sure that if they need bus cards to get to work, we, we help cover that. If right. they you know have trouble with gas, we help cover that. If they need suggestions for childcare... We tackle that as well. We help restore their credit. We get their driver's license restored. We, I mean, we we go really deep with the women that we do employ. Wow, that's amazing. How many do you employ at this point? So we're always between four and six creative designers at a time, uh, but we've just hired our 22nd woman out of the shelter uh, a couple months ago. So that was a... That was a big milestone for us. That's really, yeah. really great. And Thanks. and yeah. and I'm really trying to, as you're talking, really trying to think of the Detroit I have been to, which is largely, I, I'm sorry to say, the Fisher Building, mm-hmm. yeah. which I'm sure is still intact. But, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm sort of thinking big city, and I'm also thinking mm-hmm. Mosul or something, you know, not quite with embers, but with a lot of empty, burnt out, un, uncultivated space. I know that the uh, Detroit Art Museum was going to close down or sell its art a few mm-hmm. years ago because of the financial straits. And to think that, uh, you know, the engine is churning all over again and and people are, are I, I don't get why people don't go and scope it out. I mean, you oh, it's look a at wonderful city. You should come. You look at New York, which is so overbuilt, and which is so you know getting more and more generic. I think with every new tower that is built, and as the mom and pop shops or the the beloved coffee shop has to go out of business, and the little details that mm-hmm. tell you where you are disappear. I keep thinking. Why don't the oligarchs move to Detroit? Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. I actually have been trying to get honorary citizenship for a while. I came as close as getting deputized by the police chief. And I thought, does this count? If I just wear this pin around, will anybody, will it, will it help me in any way? <laughs> It'll help. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, you got to put in a little more time, a little more sweat equity there. Yeah. But um, it is a very special place. And I think that what is extraordinary about it, which also we don't have here in what lacks in New York, is this incredible collaborative spirit. Mm. Very much um, so. And that if if you know one great person, they want to introduce you to another great person. They're constantly thinking of ideas and yes. stepping out of their comfort zone. Um, yes, we don't have that here because we take it all for granted, and they're and we're horrible. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, but it really it's it is a it is an extraordinary thing yes. that. Um, that it's amazing and and so accurate, and I I credit the community for being as much an owner in Rebel Nell as myself, my business partner, and the women, because it 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 truly is a great place where people mean what they say. If they say they're going to help you, they will, and they will follow up, and uh, I'm, I'm fortunate to call that place home. Well, even though uh, you you weren't born in Detroit, it, you're, you're a great spokesperson for it, and um, I... I I'm very, very taken by the idea of a city coming back to life. When I was writing my guidebooks to American colleges, I'd visit places that had beautiful, they almost looked as if they were they were preserved in amber downtowns and a main street and a union station that were vacant. Mm-hmm. And it breaks your heart, you know, as manufacturing has left the country that... These towns can't be, mm. that ca- they can't survive, and they could if all these people, including people like me, got the hell out of New York <laughs> and uh, bought a building in, in somewhere in Pennsylvania, somewhere upstate in Michigan, New upstate New York. There's towns that are crying for people. Providence, and, and Rhode jobs. Island changed. Jobs. And jobs. And jobs. Right. 
Yeah. So that's the, that's the key to all these incredible communities. American manufacturing moved out, and you were left with communities that had been incredibly um, supportive of the arts and supportive of their, their parks at the community. So you go into upstate New York or wherever you're talking about, and you still see remnants of that. Yes. But with no jobs. With no one. How do you possibly, right. you know, create? You can't sustain it. Yeah. Right. By the way... All of New York ground floor is is retail is is in terrible shape. Yeah. And then they build Hudson Yards. This is my little peeve. Oh my god. And it's a glamorous, duty free mall. It's Dubai Airport. It's Dubai <laughs> Airport. It is Dubai Airport. And meanwhile, how about walking down the street and being able to buy a T shirt or a hamburger? It's very hard to do that, you know, yeah. in New York. It's It's sad what's happening, and it's exciting to hear what's happening in Detroit, and I hope it will spread to other cities and the Rust Belt will live again. Certainly, I had a dream that when Katrina happened, that people who lost their homes in the floods and and, uh, constant hurricanes of the southeast would figure out that they should go to Detroit, but who am I to tell them that? Hey, over you're, there. you're Lisa Birnbach. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Once, yeah, my exhibits don't listen to me. Why would they? <laughs> but I really feel like, wow, there's some great yeah. promise. And I know that um, some people in Silicon Valley have been making tours of the Midwest to see where they can control us. The old train, the old train station, <laughs> new places. The old yeah, train station. Ford what, just is it, the train station. Ford bought the train station. Is mm-hmm. Google going in there or something like that? Um, Google just moved um, into Little Caesars Arena, so that's where they're. But I guess the the old train station, which is majestic and yeah. was completely burned out, like not a window. You thought, I mean, there's no electricity, there's right? Like, uh, to they're putting in also like f- like a food hall. So and, yeah, uh, yeah, actually, like, I've been a part of a lot of those conversations. Which I got to be careful what is uh, what can be shared. But um, yes, f- so the the train station was just iconic of the blight in Detroit yeah. for so long. Yeah. And what I always thought was so interesting is if you're standing on the street corner where so many people took that photograph, and if you just turned around and taken the same photo, same spot, but you're like taking pictures into Corktown, you would have seen a really cute neighborhood that survived it all, right? And so, you know, there's a a lot of that storytelling. uh, Editorializing. Yeah. yeah, In a way that wasn't fair. Yeah, the ruin porn. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, actually... Ruin porn. It's such a good phrase. Yeah. Wow. Is that a term of art? Absolutely a a term. Uh, I don't know if it's a term of art, uh, but something that that Detroiters take great umbrage when people come in and are like, oh, saying this. I mean, it only only can be told as a story of, of incredible incredible revitalization and hope we i mean we lost as we talk about american manufacturing talk about the auto industry yeah right so right. um right yeah yeah they're and very sensitive of, about ruined porn yeah. yes very interesting Not my new favorite phrase ever is that good it's actually one really of my good. first dates with my husband we broke into the train station and climbed to the top really yeah back in the i mean what'd you have to do to break in there was that was you want to know <laughs> we had to crawl on our stomach underneath the underpass under a barbed wire. I mean, it was, and you could hear other people in there. There were voices or people living in the train station. I mean, it was a shell. Yeah, no, dirt she, floors. I mean, it was. Oh my! Yeah, yeah. that's a that's a dirty story. That's a dirty yeah. story. If oh, it's yeah. porn, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but you know what else? I think that um, the hope, the hope for cities, because cities don't have to be huge to be great cities. There's something so wonderful about a city that knows exactly how big it can be. Mm-hmm. And succeeds as a mid-sized or small city. Well, d- also, I mean, Detroit is so special in so many ways. I mean, it's the only city with all major league uh, sports teams right in the heart of downtown. Am I that's correct? That's true. Yep. And that's incredible. Can you that imagine being incredible. able to go to a Giants game around the, a block? No, I cannot. Um, to be, and to think of the number of people then pour in uh, on game night to the city to use the resource of the city, eat, drink, park. And then are you are going to these incredible yeah. arenas? Yeah, and they're incredible. Yep, I've been to Tiger Stadium, by the way. Just so you know, Tiger I got Stadium to... or Comerica Park. It was it's ti- Tiger Stadium. It, it was... was a long time ago. Okay, Tiger Stadium, probably. It, I, I believe it was Tiger, which Stadium. which they tore down 
those bastards. <laughs> <laughs> it was really controversial too, but now it's um, another field with apartments around it. I no, I it was Tiger Stadium because Tom Monahan owned the team then, and yeah. it was um, it was it was jaunty mm-hmm. and it was old fashioned. And it was very nice. What would be your number one thing if, when Lisa goes to Detroit with me next? What's what's the number one thing she has to do? I always send people because I think it's just such a special and and you always have interesting dialogue is to go to the Heidelberg Project. Have you been there? Mm-mm. Oh, go oh. check out the Heidelberg uh, Project. Okay, note to self. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating. Um, Can and you I, just I, I, say what it is? Yeah, or? It's, it's basically. Um, Tyree Guyton is an artist in Detroit who started this art installation um, from, I don't want to do this, any, uh, don't want to say it wrong, but my understanding is they did it for, you know, kind of social commentary back, way back when, when no one was paying attention to Detroit and he would take things that he would find and just started painting dots on houses that were abandoned to call attention to it, to the city, to say like, help, these are neighborhoods, We, we don't want this blight here. And then he just started taking over more houses. And so now there's this, it's a huge art installation on these houses in Detroit. That um, are still unoccupied? Oh, yeah, still unoccupied. Now it's become part of, the, it's called the Heidelberg Project. It's on Heidelberg Street. But I just think it's it's fascinating. I think what he did was so important and relevant at the time in which he did it. And he really did call attention to it. Um, but there's always, some people think it's, he repurposes a lot of trash. And there's a house that, when I first saw it, was like, oh, my God. God, this is so cool and so creepy. It's just got stuffed animals on it. Creepy. From oh. top to bottom, it's just stuffed animals. Whoa. So that would that's where I like to send people. That's where we'll go. Yes. We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. Uh, you both prepared your five things, mm-hmm. and I've already shared mine. You know, it was a, it, it's a task to, to it really is. condense five things that make life better because you... I think as we started this about people who like you're viewing the world how how you're reacting to it I kept saying the phrase out loud because I kept saying five things that make me happy why am I keep reading this that way I, oh and I well, feel you can. that I feel that I have answered it as five things that make me happy so I'd like that as a caveat and I'd like no judgment no judgment okay, I think uh, sometimes it's five That's things so that the yeah, same thing. yeah five things that I don't hate. I mean, but right? but there. But I read it as five things that make my life better, okay. as opposed to our work. Uh, Amy and I every day do things uh, that are so outside of ourselves. Thank you for allowing us to be so self indulgent. This was a lot of fun, actually. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it reminds all of us that there is joy to be had on gloomy days, and that's certainly how I started this enterprise. And it also reminds us that. You know, it's okay to to be good to yourself. Yeah. Uh, apparently, this is considered a self help podcast. Yes, thank you. I so I didn't realize that when I started <laughs> it. I thought it was just a Lisa Help podcast. <laughs> I, th- I think that um, sometimes I don't know if you feel this way, but sometimes our work can um, you can forget that it's okay also to feed your own needs or soul. Yes. Or, mouth <laughs> absolutely absolutely constantly yeah. i think that that's a that's a real moment and i oh my gosh yeah I, this is very stressful work that we do and i cry a lot you have 22 okay. women whose lives whose yeah. uh, families are literally depending on you and yeah yep. you are uh once yep. you go down that path and you show people that there can be uh hope or a better way or safety or safe streets you have it, it's not you don't engage in it lightly I think yeah. and you're only 38 and God knows what mark you will continue to make on the world both in Detroit and beyond we're pretty thank sure you. it'll be amazing thank yeah. you guys okay why don't you go first Jessica okay five things that make my life better <laughs> I've done them. Um, number one is being near water any mm. water preferably the ocean but really any water that's so good. Uh, it's a good one. I know. I wish I had taken that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll share it. Okay. Amy <laughs> Mine, Peterson. Um, I, my daycare is amazing, and they let my son, who's three years old, wear like his Halloween costumes like every other day, and it just is so nice when I don't have to pick that battle in the morning. And I asked them the other day, I was like, do you guys mind that he comes in looking like Superman or some combination of four or five superheroes all at once? And they're like, no, it's fine. 
Now, wait, why would they care? I didn't know if it would be problematic with other kids. Oh, then or all what, the kids uh, yeah. want to be. And they're like, hairs. if it makes your life better, it makes our life better. So I was like, great. He'll be Buzz Lightyear by Friday. Thank <laughs> Kudos you. Kudos to them. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. Yeah. They're great. Creative. Place. And it allows you to go to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And not worry about your son, which is a big deal. Number two. Number two, when my teenage sons, and I have two, 18 and 16, and all of their friends camp out at my house for hours or days eating unacceptable junk food, pizza, on and on, and their shoes line the hallway, it mm. is something that fills me like you, like nobody's business. That they that the, that your, there. yours is there. the house yeah. they want to be. It makes me so happy. Oh, You're the mom. cool mom. Yeah. I'm, trying, I'm trying so hard. Yeah. It's, sometimes it's obvious, but yeah. No, no, it's all, it's, <laughs> listen, it's, I, I share that when my youngest daughter, who was home alone with me at the end, uh, after the other two, had gone off, and I know it was miserable for her. So when her friends would come by, I just felt, this is where I want to be, and this I'm so happy she's here. Yeah, I get yeah. it. I built a, a poker table down in the basement, so we may be running an illegal gambling ring with all oh. of my joint enthusiasm. Shh, 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 yeah. shh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Amy, number two. Uh, podcasts. I just recently started listening to podcasts ever since I became CEO full-time at Rebel Now. I find them... I never never really understood them before, but the, I learn so much. I enjoy them when I'm running. I listen to them constantly, and so I think that they are such an amazing learning tool in this day and age. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah. Except for this one. Yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Number three. Number three for me is being a redhead. Ah. It does make me happy. When I was a kid, it was a misery because I wanted to look like Amy with blonde hair. Do but people tease redheads they, really? They tease them. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's a con. I mean, I, between being a redhead and left handed, it was a tough. Oh my God, my sister's redhead and left handed. Really? Yes. You see? See, I'm nearsighted and can't whistle. So people <laughs> were really mean to me and, and had glasses. So, And I'm a, a Connecticut lifer. So uh, I was not blonde. Mm. Oh yeah. yeah, that's true. So this, but and I didn't tan, and I had you know freckles and sunburn, and that was a yeah. whole thing. And then one day, when you become an adult and you realize that there is something that you can uh, take as your own, your unique quality, and uh, make it part of how you uh, enter the world, and um, it's something I I really appreciate about myself. Excellent, and you have great cheekbones. Thank you so much. <laughs> As she sucks it in. <laughs> Number three? Uh, we do this thing called Daily Harvest, and it's this, these frozen meals that come. And it's not like the fresh meals that come because those we fail miserably. They just go oh. bad. But this, you just, oh, they're amazing. You blend them or you throw them in a... They look like smoothies, right? Yes. They but advertise they have, incessantly. They do. And I will say, and I, this is not meant to be a product placement. I just, they they work great for our lifestyle because we're just three of us and we just make it like that and try it's like a nice way for us to eat healthy when we have insane lives wait a second is it like soylent green <laughs> i don't is know what it, that is that's this futuristic one meal uh, all the nutrients that you need for i don't know if it's even that good but it was in a movie right maybe You're maybe so it's like young that. um <laughs> no but they're tasty or they're, they're gross they're, they're delicious okay and I, we like them. And your kid likes them? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, give or take. But do they do they puree chicken nuggets? Yeah, that's <laughs> honestly whoever comes up with that. <laughs> genius, genius, genius! You could throw in some spinach in there. Oh my god, you'd be a millionaire. <laughs> Number four. Well, it's unfortunate that I have to follow that one. Yes, it is. This yeah. is not good timing. Yeah, Amy's having healthy smoothies. <laughs> Uh, and feeding her kid vegetables, my number four is French fries. And yes. I'm so happy that you and I have shared our, our versions of French fries. And I'm not picky. It's not like... I was going to say, what are your favorite? No, it's not like... All I of like them. All of them. Really? I mean, Do you like thick all, cut? All, uh, whatever. All huh. Just Better well, if... Crispy. Yeah. I don't even need to say anything here really? to reinforce I mean, it, but... Yeah. Or serious had, about this. Yeah, we apparently. have had dinners of French fries. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I'm... 70% French fry. <laughs> you are tall and skinny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, come back next week. Um, okay, number four. Uh, uh, f- 
for. Yeah, for I, I love running my own company and being surrounded by amazing women on a daily basis. I'm very fortunate. It's the hardest job I've ever had. I've never worked more in my life. And I truly, I love it. I love that I get to now do this cool stuff. Like, this is badass to me. And because you flew or drove to Detroit to work in baseball, mm-hmm. because baseball was your dream passion do you still include going to baseball games or do you is baseball even a factor in your life any longer no oddly oddly no i i I don't have time for it which is crazy it was my life then and my gosh i would i could tell you not only the starting lineup and their batting averages for our team but the incoming team i knew everything and now i have no idea wow when i go and you're still so satisfied I love you my job. You have a great right life now. without baseball. I do. I do. I would go back at some point in time if the culture was right. Yeah, but uh, right now I really like this. Great. Great. Number five, Jessica. Um, I think I could definitely go to your son's preschool because I love when I feel like a superhero and doing what I do and taking destruction, turning it into beauty, taking people's pain and giving them hope is uh, something that has made, brought me incredible joy and made my life better. Excellent. Beautiful and true. And Amy, number five, also beautiful, true, <laughs> and equally excellent. Equally beautiful, true, is wine. Yes. I, uh, yes. She can do French fries and wine with <laughs> yes. us. Oh, yeah. I yeah. like this is a good combo. That's yeah. why we're going to lunch. After. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, the two of you have made my day better and mm. my life better. And I uh, remind our listeners that you can find out more about Rebel Nell at my website, lisabernbach.com, and also at rebelnell.com. You can find out more about the Caliber Collection also on my website and at Jessica's website, calibercollection.com. You've been listening to Five Things That Make Life Better with me, Lisa Bernbach. My guests this week are a dynamic duo of superheroes, Amy Peterson and Jessica Mindich. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Is there any other place <laughs> left? I mean, my God. Um, also, you can you can rate this one if you like it. If you don't like it, don't rate it and don't come back. But if you like it, give me a five or 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 uh, I don't know what you can do. Send me a a heart. My blog is at (laughs) lisabernbach.com where you'll find links and photos about all the things we spoke about here today. This podcast is produced in New York City by thefieldtv.com. My engineer is Jimmy Regan. Say hi, Jimmy. And my team is Spresso Rucci, Michael Port, and Sam Haft. Until next week, stay cool and act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Bernbach. New episodes every Friday if she remembers.